Well, well, looky here. It's time to fry some fish. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 546 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Open source is the name of the game this week, my friends. Arun Gupta from Intel joins me to discuss how open source initiatives foster innovation. We also chat about Intel's history in the open source community, the evolution of Intel's open source strategy, and the progressive open source initiatives Intel is working on right now. Also this week, I check out the details of an open source tool from MIT's Sensible City Lab that can help people measure air pollution cheaply from anywhere. But first, please welcome Arun to Fish Fry. Hi, Arun. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Emily. I'm super excited to be here. Excellent. Okay, so Intel has been involved with the open source community for a long time. But for my audience who may not know, tell us a bit about this history. Absolutely. Well, Intel has been involved with open source for over two decades, actually. And when I came here about a year ago, that was quite a surprise to me. If you think about Intel fosters an open ecosystem strategy, and if you think about open ecosystem It is open source, open API, open hardware, open spec, open data. So we participate a lot larger than open source. And our open ecosystem strategy is to really build trust, deliver choice, and ensure interoperability, not just for Intel, but for the entire industry. So if you were to kind of think about why is Intel doing that, Intel is really committed to open source and has been from the very beginning. We have been the largest corporate contributor to Linux kernel since 2007. And we are one of the top contributors to Kubernetes. We are also participating in 700 plus open source standard bodies and foundations. For example, myself, I am on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation Governing Board and the Governing Board Chair as well. That's not code related, but that's a lot of chop wood carry water, as you say in the open source communities. I'm also on the Open SSF, Open Source Security Foundation Governing Board. And then there are people from Intel, like Kathy Zhang, who is on the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee. There is Crow, who is on the OpenSSF TAC, Technical Advisory Council and Chair of the TAC. There is Dan Middleton, who is the TAC Chair for Confidential Computing Consortium. So the presence is very wide, not just code related, but literally lots of chop wood and carry water as well. So Intel engineers, we contribute to hundreds of open source projects and develop design and release open source software to the community. I mean, think about PyTorch, TensorFlow, you know, LLVM, GCC, you name a project, our customers who are Silicon customers consume our product using these open source projects. So that's where Intel is super excited to contribute to these open projects so that they can realize the best features of our platforms. Fantastic. Now, let's talk about Intel's open ecosystem strategy. And Arun, how does it fit within your company's broader software strategy? It very well does. And if you think about it, you know, Pat Gelsinger, who's our CEO, always talks about how open ecosystem is very pivotal to our product strategy. Anything and everything that we have done is really about building that open ecosystem going all the way from USB, UCACI, all of these interfaces that we have created over the years. Open source software or open ecosystem work is happening all across the company, whether is the client business unit where they are actively contributing to Chrome or Linux or you know, pick a software on the client side, JavaScript, where they're actively contributing over there. Or the software group you know, where we are actively contributing to Kubernetes and Android and a Linux kernel and a wide range of products. Or you pick a data center group where we are actively working with customers on projects like you know Kafka and Hadoop and Cassandra so that they are optimized to continue to work for our platform in the most optimal manner. So we really work all across the board, across the company. Intel's open source innovations has always played a key role in the company's success. When Intel actively participates in community-led projects, that benefits everyone, not just Intel. And we ourselves thrive on the feedback from the community. 
We also adhere to the champions and champions the code of conduct as set forth by organizations such as Contributor Covenant, GitHub and CNCF. And really all contributions to community managed projects are really truly done upstream and available in downstream distros because customers don't fork repos. They download the distros. So that's been sort of the mentality, the culture, the thought process in the company that how do we make sure the software that is available to our customers is fully optimized for Intel architecture. Fantastic. Now, can you discuss a bit about the innovations that Intel is working on and how these innovations foster an open ecosystem? What are the benefits overall for the developer community? Sapphire Rapids, which was launched earlier this year, which is uh, Xeon 4, is getting ready to be released in multiple cloud providers. Now, on those cloud providers, if you are building your applications, say microservices, that is leveraging, say, Kubernetes, and you are writing those microservices using, say, Java application, those are the projects that are directly used by customers. So in OpenJDK, for example, which is the open source implementation of Java, Intel Teams actively contributes to OpenJDK so that latest accelerators, whether it is hashing or crypto or security, those features are enabled. So now, from a customer point of view, Intel has done the work in OpenJDK and the Sapphire Rapids is available in AWS. Amazon has this downstream distro called as Amazon Coretto. So essentially, if you pick up Amazon Coretto, the work that we have done in upstream is already available to you at your usual channels. So that's sort of the mentality. That's the thought process all across that just like OpenJDK, similarly, you know, PyTorch, PyTorch, we provided that one DNN library, which is the default algorithm by which you can make your PyTorch programs more efficient. That's again done in upstream. Any customer who's building a downstream product using upstream PyTorch, they have that one DNN available to them as default. So we truly, truly look at specific projects. What are the innovations that are happening? so that the developers don't have to change their programming model. Our optimizations are available to them in a default manner in upstream and then eventually in downstream. So think in terms of a flywheel. We have our Intel engineering teams contributing to upstream. Those innovations are then available in downstream distros and then those are utilized by customers and then customers tell us, hey, I need more of these features. So that's the flywheel that we have been building over the last several months How do we make open ecosystem a lot more relevant for everybody in the flywheel? That makes sense. Now, Arun, what does Intel have planned for the future when it comes to open source initiatives? Yeah, I mean, we are very customer obsessed. So we don't start contributing to projects like, okay, which project should we contribute to? So our customers tell us, hey, here is a project that is becoming relevant. Here is where we would like you to contribute. So we really, really listening to customer feedback as I was talking about the flywheel The third part of the flywheel is really customer giving us feedback. And then, of course, Intel is also deeply involved in a wide range of open source communities. As I talked about those foundations and standard bodies, so we're really keeping an eye on the pulse. And we also talk to industry leaders all across the board. So there are multiple data points. We look at analyst reports. We look at customers. We look at foundations. We look at what are the cool innovations happening. Where can we contribute? So we look at multiple touch points you know, in, on the radar. And that's what basically leads to our decision where the engineering efforts should be going. All right. Well, Arun, I think I'm ready to send you an off-the-cuff question. So, Arun, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off-the-cuff. So... If you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, the restaurant is closed, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Oh, that would be Sambar Dosa. As a South Indian food, I have a fetish for that food. I remember I was in Bangalore once for about six weeks with my wife. And uh, uh, Bangalore is in South India. And I had that thing every breakfast, every lunch, and every dinner. And I still you know, crave for it. So I, I, I can have that food any point of time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, Arun, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. No, Amelia, thank you. I really enjoyed I would recommend people go to open.intel.com, which talks a lot more about our strategy, our projects. We have lots of deeply technical blogs over there. We have a podcast over there. We would love to cross-host you, bring you over there. 
So all sorts of exciting stuff we are doing. If you see us at any open source event like KubeCon or Open Source Summit or whatever, come say hello. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know how it is where you are, but here in Oregon, we have had the not so awesome distinction of being at the very top of the worst air quality in the whole world recently. I have been searching for air quality numbers in Portland pretty frequently. But what about for areas of the world where air quality isn't extensively measured? Enter MIT's Sensible City Labs Flatburn Mobile Pollution Detector. And guess what? It's low cost and open source. Okay, so first, the goal of this project is pretty incredible. Carlo Ratti, director of MIT's Sensible City Lab, states it like this. The goal is for community groups or individual citizens anywhere to be able to measure local air pollution, identify its sources, and ideally create feedback loops with officials and stakeholders to create cleaner conditions. So let's get into the details. So this Flatburn project was originally conceived way back in 2017, when researchers at MIT began working on mobile pollution detectors. Originally, the idea was to put these rechargeable pollution detectors, which can be made from 3D printed parts or outsourced using inexpensive components, to be deployed on garbage trucks in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the data they would collect would be accessed remotely. Fast forward to today, and the Flatburn project has now been extended to include New York City and the entire Boston area. And now, this team from MIT has a host of performance metrics to compare with already working pollution detection systems. In both New York and Boston, this team from MIT worked alongside state officials to compare the flatburn devices against other state-of-the-art systems over a four-week period. In both cases, the detectors were set up to measure concentrations of fine particulate matter which includes tiny particles often associated with burning matter, power plants, internal combustion engines, and more, as well as nitrogen dioxide, over an area of about 10 meters. And you know what? The Flatburn mobile pollution detectors worked. So this team did find that these flat burn detectors estimated somewhat lower concentrations of fine particulate matter than the other devices in use. But there was a strong enough correlation that with adjustments for weather conditions and other factors, that these devices could produce reliable results. On Wang, a researcher at Sensible City Lab and one of the associated paper's co-authors says this about the results. After following their deployment for a few months, we can confidently say that our low-cost monitors should behave the same way as standard detectors. We have a big vision, but we still have to make sure that the data we collect is valid and can be used for regulatory and policy purposes. So Flatburn does have a couple drawbacks. At least when they are used in those mobile settings, like on top of a vehicle. This team found that these units only have an operating shelf life of about six months. They also identified a couple other potential issues that operators of these devices may have to deal with, including an issue that the team calls drift, which is the gradual changing of the detector's readings over time, as well as aging, the more fundamental deterioration of the unit's physical condition. So the flat burn is actually part of a greater 
project called City Scanner, which uses mobile devices to better understand urban life. As part of this project, Sensible City Lab has set up several different pilots around the world where they have refined a set of prototypes with software and hardware and protocols to make sure the data they collect is robust from an environmental science point of view. An Wang explains the open source element of Flatburn that reinforces the goals of City Scanner. Hopefully, with the release of the open source Flatburn, we can get grassroots groups as well as communities in less developed countries to follow our approach and build and share knowledge. So, this team from Sensible City Lab are providing complete instructions in their release of Flatburn, as well as an open source tool, and this also includes guidance for working with officials, communities, and stakeholders to process the results and attempt to shape action. Fabio Durante, Principal Research Scientist at Sensible City Lab, sums up the project like this. He says, The original idea of the project was to democratize environmental data, and that is still the goal. We want people to have the skills to analyze the data and engage with communities and officials. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about Sensible City Lab, the Flatburn Mobile Pollution Detector, or Intel's open source initiatives, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this week's episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978 and hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me. <laughs> and you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fryin page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of August 25th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>